you know, everyone thinks crayons, they think Crayola. Well, how can you grow if you're Crayola? You're the crayon leader. You're, you have these boxes. And, you know, the thing, I'm sure they had these conversations, you know, how can we grow? You know, we're about crayons. Um, let me think. Uh, we got 24, we got 64. Wait a minute. What about if we have a box of crayons that are like 48 crayons for that kid who's gotten bored with the 24, but it's not quite ready for the 64. So we have like a box of 48. And maybe we put it in a round box. And they have all these conversations about crayons, crayons, crayons. And finally someone raises their hand and says, you know what? We don't have to be just about crayons. Crayons are about coloring. Coloring, they're about imagination. So why aren't we about colorful, you know, imaginative products? Why not colorful arts and crafts for kids? If we're about that, we're not about crayons. So why don't we introduce markers, at least? Markers are different from crayons. You know, they're functionally different products. And, and that actually, it's interesting, when you expand the brand, the hardest step is the first step outside your box, or in their case, literally, if you're going to be their box. Because consumers are so used to you being one thing. Once you take that step, then all of a sudden people are like, they're not just about crayons. And then all of a sudden, if you go to a store in North America, and actually Europe, they're, they're sold in a lot of parts of the world, Crayola. They've got a whole section. And it's all these kinds of arts and crafts and glue and paints and all kinds of things. And they were so smart. Because they were smart to realize, we're not about crayons. We're about, you know, we, they understood their potential. So that's really, really critical. And, you know, it, it, it Virgin's another one. Now, Virgin, we could spend an hour on. They're an interesting brand. They do some good things. They do some bad things. So they're good examples and bad examples of Virgin. The thing I like about them, though, is their basic promise is to go into categories where customers' needs are not well met and to meet them better. And basically, to meet them by doing different things and doing things differently. That's their model. And when they're at their best, they get it totally right. They really, really do. So, you know, so, so to me, that's, that promise is so expansive, and that's a little bit of their challenge, because you know, they've got so many of these. Now, Virgin Galactic, I don't even know if it's up there. That's space. That's when you're going to go off into space. Okay. And we'll see how that goes. Um, but I think what's interesting with Virgin, when they're at their best, they do exactly this. And when they run into trouble, it's when they go into categories where customers' needs are actually probably OK, like Virgin Cola. Do you think people were that unhappy about Coke and Pepsi? I don't think so. So Virgin Cola failed because it was a category that people's needs were basically OK. They're at their best when they go into like you know, Virgin Air, when people are dissatisfied with airlines, and they do things you know, really different. Uh, next imperative is to do the right thing with brands. And there are two parts to this one. There are two parts. And that's to basically, uh, one of them is to do the right thing with brands in terms of managing brands for the long run. And that's about avoiding, overexposing, overextending, overmodernizing, over discounting brands. And I'm going to talk about death by a thousand cuts in a second. Starbucks will be an example of that. The other is to embrace corporate social responsibility. I'm totally convinced that I think um, going forward, the companies are more and more going to have to have some emphasis on this, have a point of view on this. Customers are going to want to hear about this, and especially younger customers. One advantage about being around a university is you're surrounded by young people through the years, and you learn about how they change. And students now are different from students 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. You just see the changes. And one of them is younger, especially the students these days, are more concerned about the environment, about social things, because they're seeing a world that has a lot of problems, and they're concerned about it. So you see that, and I think you know, developing these cause marketing programs that are win-win. British Airways, for the longest time, they have a new program now. For years, it was Change for Good. Do you remember that program? You know, the back of those seat pockets. They, it was made so much sense because what do you need the money for? I mean, a little change, you know, your coins from one country as you fly to another country. You don't really need the coins. Just toss them in the envelope, give it to British Airways, uh, fly, fly to people. And it was UNICEF. And they gave it to UNICEF, and that went into different parts of the world where they could do good things. It's now Flying Start, which is with Comic Relief out of the UK, because they want to bring it a little closer to home, not just into Africa and other parts of the world, but also partly Britain. So it's now called Flying Start. So death by a thousand cuts. Here's the thing I worry about. And, and, and I actually, I had a chance to meet, you know, at least shake a lot of your hands, uh, or some of your hands. 
And there's some really good brands and very successful brands in this, in this audience today. And here's the thing I worry about for you. It's the death by a thousand cuts. This is the thing I learned about this from Disney 25 years ago. Because the Disney brand was so strong, and they told me this is the thing we worry about. Everyone says, well, you know, you're such a strong brand. We're such a strong brand. You know, so we're we doing this deal that's not quite really Disney. Who cares? It's only one little deal. That's fine, but what about when it's not just one, it's 10, 50, or 100 of those deals. It's death by a thousand pounds. That's the, it's the compromises you make. This brand is so strong. Well, these multiple compromises, shortcuts, can cause a lot of problems. And here, my example is actually Starbucks. Starbucks, again, fascinating brand. You could talk about it for an hour or two easily. The good and bad things they've done, very successful. They do a lot of these imperatives that I'm talking about really well, but they've gone off track. And their problem was that basically Howard Schultz, a couple years ago, he had left the CEO and he said, look, we'd forgotten what we were about. We forgot we were about coffee. We kind of lost track of what made our, us. They went from using bad coffee instead of using freshly ground coffee so that there was no longer that aroma in the stores. They weren't scooping the coffee. They weren't grinding it. They lost the theater, if you will. They put these machines in that kind of blocked the way people saw things. It was the whole experience got transformed through a series of little decisions. And all of a sudden, the magic was gone. It was just like any other fast food restaurant. You know, put your order a minute later or two, out comes your product. Nothing about a relationship, about any sort of experience. So basically what he did was, he came, this was literally only the last couple of years, he came back in as CEO, he stepped down, came back in, and just changed a lot of things to say, we've got to go back to what makes Starbucks great. We've got to go back to the coffee and that experience and doing things uh, in the right way. And then, so that's the first one. And then the second one is about cause. It's about win-win. And I am a big believer in cause marketing programs because they can be win-win. If you do them right, they build your brand and they're helping out society and some organization that needs help. And the reason why is because of all these benefits, I won't go through all of these, but you can differentiate yourself, create emotional response, you know, you can create bonds with customers and employees. It's a lot for your public image. And again, I think it drives sales if you do it right. So I've got so many examples. The one down there is one lens crafter, which is uh, uh, eyeglass store in North America, and, and they actually are part of a, a global organization that's all through Europe and other parts of Asia and through the world. Um, but LensCrafter came up with this program called Give the Gift of Sight. So you need to go get a new pair of glasses. And chances are you need a new pair of glasses because your eyes have gotten worse. You don't need your old pair of glasses because they're not working. Okay? So why don't, as you buy the new pair of glasses, Give them your old pair of glasses, they'll take them. The beauty of glasses is I, can, I know exactly what that prescription is. I can figure that out. And I can send that to Africa or whatever part of the world where people need and cannot afford glasses. And I can give those to them. It's a great program. There's another brand recently that came out called Tom's Shoes. Have you heard about Tom's Shoes? Anybody? Tom's is a really new brand. It's an embarrassing story. Tom's Shoes came out, a young guy, up with this about probably four or five years ago. And he basically, for every pair of shoes you buy, he donates a pair of shoes to some part of the world where people need shoes. And there's so many, if you don't have shoes, there's health issues, there's education issues, there's a bunch of problems. So it's a really cool idea, I think, because it's just reinforced. Again, they're very inexpensive shoes, but they are shoes they're giving these kids. So very, very neat. So anyway, I'm, I'm a big believer in this. I think it's the key to make it work, though, is it has to be a win-win, which means it has to build your brand. So I'm, as much as I believe in it, I have to be very hard-nosed about it, because if it's, you know, otherwise it's philanthropy, and it may get turned on or off. But if it's truly a successful cause program, it builds brand, and it helps the cause. All right, so my last imperative is the one I will go into the least detail with, okay? And not to tease you, but this actually, my textbook has a lot on this, and you all have a copy of my textbook, is that correct? That's part of your party, party gifts for today, if I'm not mistaken. So, isn't that correct? That's correct, right? So it's in the textbook. Okay. <laughs> so I'm not teasing that much. So basically, this is about 
really understanding with marketing what's worked and why, big picture, greater accountability, marketing investments. I think that companies need to have a comprehensive, cohesive, and actual set of models to help develop ROI insights and, and interpretation. And those three companies, or all three companies I've worked with, and all three of these companies use some of the models that I'm going to you know, briefly highlight. I have basically three models that I've been using and different for years and years. Procter Gamble is the one that's in, it's, does all of them. And it's part of every one of the brands, global brands around the world, that use all three of these models in a different way. Uh, and they're the Russian doll models. So if you will, it's, I think it's Matryoshka dolls. Is that right? For those who know they're Russian correctly, one goes inside, another goes inside, another. And for a while there, I was calling them babushka dolls, which is like dead wrong. Okay, so I went to Russia and I was calling them babushka dolls, and they're just like laughing at me. So Matryoshka dolls. <laughs> okay, I'm correct. Um, so Matryoshka dolls, and the way it's, it's the positioning is the smallest, most specific, and I've got a model of positioning that talks about points of parity and points of difference that is completely different from traditional positioning and the positioning statement, which I think is a powerful way to do positioning. My second model is the brand resonance model or customer-based brand equity model. Very full way of sort of talking about building brand relationships. Um, it's a very detailed model. Procter & Gamble took this model and all the measures that went with it and created something called equity scan, which they use around the world to measure the health of their brands. That's how they track their brands with this model. I like this model a lot. It's about how to create intense, active loyalty relations. Resonance is when customers have a deep, active connection and engagement with the brand. And that's your goal as a marketer. They literally resonate. When something resonates, that's your goal. And you only resonate if you have, if you hit the head and the heart, you build the right kinds of uh, programs and marketing to, to make that happen. And then finally, the brand value chain model is the biggest model. And that basically talks about uh, how you then, your marketing investments affect the customer mindset in terms of this resonance model, which in turn affects the market performance of your brand, price premiums, loyalty, all these different outcomes, which affects your shareholder value. So these are the three models. And again, I, like I said, I'm just highlighting this. And I actually don't care if you, you know, I like these models, you know, some companies like these models, but the key is to have some models out there. I think they're really important. And I think they have to be comprehensive. I think they have to be cohesive, hang together, and they have to be action. That's the goal. And I think that's what I try to do with these three models. Points of parity, points of difference, there's more details, a lot more details here, but you know, again, the highlight. That goes into the residence model, the second level performance and imagery, which you know ultimately leads to residence. And then the residence model again plugs in the value chain model, app marketing activity, market performance, show over value, that's the customer. So those were our six branding imperatives. Fully and accurately factor the consumer in the equation, go beyond product performance, rational benefits to connect emotionally, make the whole of the brand program greater than some of the parts by mixing and matching, like we said in different ways. I focus on communications. We could have talked about channels. Understand where you can take a brand and how to achieve its potential, develop the right architecture going forward. Do the right thing with brands, both in terms of the long run to not take advantage, to over uh, um, big compromises and over promote and over discount, over extend, and also do the right thing with cause. And then again, take a big picture view of branding effects and know what's working and why and how through these sort of nested models. So I, uh, this last topic, I threw this in. This is kind of the bonus, okay? So you get the bonus. This is a special bonus. Um, because it's Friday afternoon and you're really good to be here on a Friday afternoon. So you get a bonus, right? The bonus is a little bit about building brands in tough economic times. You know, I don't always talk about this, but just, and I'm only gonna highlight one thing, actually. Um, going through a recession recently, it was interesting. In North America especially, last summer it started to go bad again, and a lot of people got very worried. Still not clear where we are right now, to be honest. It didn't get worse, which is good. Hasn't gotten a lot better, which is, so we're sort of in between right now. Um, so anyway, the, the five things I talk about in, with a recession, I talk about, look, explore the upside of increasing investments. There are a lot of brands that take advantage of recessions because of their situation, and they come out of the recession so much better off than any other brand because they can do a little investment. So that's, you start with that. Two is to say, now I really have to get closer to the customer because recession changes people's behavior. 
I need to understand how and why they're doing that. Three is to rethink how you spend your money. It's a great chance to go back to all those things you've been doing for years. Does it really make sense? Does it still work, especially now that I know more about my consumer? Fourth is to come up with the best value proposition. I'm going to talk about that more in a second. And then finally, five is it's a great chance to fine tune your product. Get rid of some brands and products aren't doing that well. You can really clean up your architecture, which doesn't happen as much as it probably should be. I did want to say something about value propositions because I this is so important. And value proposition, I've always loved the concept of value because value is it's about all the things you get for what you give up. It's all the benefits over all the costs. So it's not just about quality. It's not just about price. It goes beyond that. So I've always found that really interesting. So it's all the economic, functional, psychological benefits, as well as all the monetary, time, energy, psychological costs associated with buying a product or service. So value is a very complex idea. So getting that right, and there are two things to getting value right. One is obviously to create value and understand the value you create. So it's not just about product and quality and price. And the danger in a recession, the danger in tough economic times, is that people will overly focus on price. And the problem with that is they're ignoring all the other costs, and they're ignoring often all the other benefits. So they narrowly focus on price. And, and you have to convince them and frame it with them for they, them to realize that that's a mistake because that doesn't account the true value. That I can choose the lowest price and actually get a worse value, okay? Which ultimately matters. So, and here are my two examples. I mean, this is to me one of the more fascinating stories of the last decade or so. If I had told you 15 years ago that the, that the most valuable brand between these two brands, Samson and Sony, was Samson versus Sony, you would say you're crazy. No way. I mean, Sony was the gold standard, right? It was the most highest quality, most expensive. People just loved Sony. Well, right now, Samson is kicking Sony's butt right now. <laughs> They're doing really well, okay? Very successful. And the classic example, because they have a great value proposition. Because their products have the same quality, technology, actually a little more design and style than Sony, and they're a little less expensive. Is a great value proposition. And right now, Honda, these are Korean, the other interesting thing is the big Korean company versus Japanese company. And that makes it a little interesting too. Um, so Hyundai and Toyota. Well, Hyundai's doing the exact same thing with Toyota. So trying to increase the quality, have a stronger design component, a little more interesting. Toyota can be a little bland, if you will. It tends to be, you know, it's not huge styling. Toyota's not sort of leading edge, if you will. And I trying to do a little bit more on that side, but also just trying to do basic value propositions, just a really good value, quality and stuff. Again, don't know about India yet, because I don't know the, I've seen a lot of them on the road. I'm not sure exactly about how its evolution. Uh, fascinating, I did a little project for Hyundai in Europe last year, and it was fascinating to see how much progress they've been making in Europe. So they're not nearly as far along as Samson is against Sony, but these guys are coming on strong. And I think it's a very interesting story. And to me, it's all about value. Because if they're really matching them with quality, maybe just, you know, even exceeding them with design and coming in at a slightly lower price.